Good morning, Michelle. Hello there. Hi, Art. Good to see yeah. you. I I knew that your meeting was uh, coming up, and I thought, well, I don't have an awful lot to uh, to add to it, but I'll find out what's going on. Was not sure whether it was today or tomorrow because it's confusing. You said that the meeting yeah. is tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I accidentally tomorrow. cut. I accidentally cut and pasted the uh, notice from yesterday. Yeah, I kind of figured that that's what you yeah. did. But your previous meetings have been on Wednesdays, so I thought, well, maybe it is tomorrow. So, yeah, these have always been on Tuesdays. So we're we're they, we're on we're on schedule. Yeah, this is our usual time slot, and we okay. added another one. Good. For uh, the afternoon. I saw the last meeting, I thought it was on Wednesday, but maybe not. I don't remember. I don't think we have, we don't have a standing meeting on Wednesday, but we, we sometimes uh, meet up to talk about stuff uh, on various days. I know that we have had, we've had Wednesday meetings in the past, but we try to keep them on Tuesdays, at least for the, uh, for the phase four stuff. Okay. Um, well, I'm not quite sure what, what the meetings are all about, but I thought that I'd join in today and see what's going on. Oh, sure. No, you're and very maybe welcome. I get a little bit more informed as to what you guys are up to. We do try. Yeah, this is a, what this is, is a, a sort of a weekly meeting for all of our field programmable gate array work. So what we're, uh, what we focus on is FPGA stuff. Uh, and what we do for the meeting is talk about what we've done over the past week and then what we're going to be planning to do over the next week and then if we have any resources that we need so if somebody needs something to get get things done um, or if there's any roadblocks that are in their way so something that they don't know how to do or is hit a wall on uh, and then we can call in help and so those are the kind of the four things that we try to do every week um, in in a lot of traditional management structures that use agile this is done every day uh, but we don't do that so for for a volunteer organization we do it once a week on when on okay. on tuesdays well so. I, I thought that fpga was just fpga and once you knew how to write the code then it's a done deal let's go on to something else boy but that would be it. really nice i would like that <laughs> maybe there's more to, maybe there's more to it than that always yeah sign me up for for just knowing how to write the it's just like a general purpose processor you know oh it's yeah, easy yeah. just uh you know just whip some code up and just a small matter of programming to yeah, I, ship I know it. There's, I know there's a, an extremely long or uh, uh, learning curve uh, to know how to write a PGA software, but once you've got it, I guess you've got it. Then that uh, that's why I didn't know whether there's anything special that you had to know about FPGAs. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. That's something that we we come up against a lot. Is that there is. Um, there's a lot of good tutorials that'll get you up and running with your FPGA board, or that'll get you to the point uh, where you can do some sort of hello world. Uh, and then there's pretty much nothing. You kind of get dropped on the floor. If you're trying to do some sort of adaptive or, or um, ambitious project, um, and I think what we're trying to do with the multiplexing transverter for microwave is, is uh is complex. There's a lot of stuff that just hasn't been done uh, before in open source work. Um, then, then you're you're kind of like, well, how do you how exactly do you do it? And there may not be any good examples or good pedagogy out there. So there's not a lot in the middle in that vast center part. And you can find some good examples of some some very complex code, uh, like at the PhD level. But these are snapshots. So you know, it's a uh, it, the learning curve is is exceptionally uh, steep i i believe for for any sort of fpga work and uh the crossover or the the number of people that are good at radio and that have a a, a working knowledge of like digital communications and rf uh, and the people that also know how to write hdl code that overlap is very small and those people are in hot demand so getting a volunteer that knows both is uh deeply appreciated and valued for us because uh well we've helped a lot of people get better jobs and we've put a lot of people into phd programs but uh you know it's a, a constant uh battle to try to to staff up and to stay staffed in a in a we're competing with uh 
uh, with lots of companies that would really like to pay people a lot of money. So we, we view that as like part of our educational mission. We're, we're helping just like uh, the, the amateur license says that you're supposed to help with the technical core in the U.S. And I can tell you, we've certainly done it. Uh, you know, this is just an area where there's not a lot of people and a huge amount of demand. Um, okay. So, well, you know, I've <clears throat> I've worked with, you know, Charles, uh, Charles Brain, and that uh, he yes. started in on the FPGA because we get an FPGA on the DATV Express Board. And he started in fresh on that, didn't know anything about FPGA programming, FPGAs. So he started from scratch and that then brought himself up to speed on it. So uh, I, I know it from that standpoint and I know it from a hardware perspective. So uh, I leave the software up to him and that uh, he seems to have accomplished it and that uh, we'll go on from there. So that's that's my FPGA experience. Well, that, that all jives pretty close to mine. Uh, it was a trial by fire to, to work in ASICs uh, and it was th being thrown in to the deep end of the pool and, you know, figuring it out and, and then getting some, some working designs. Um, I guess my goal is to make it not that harsh of an experience mm -hmm. <laughs> to make it a little bit better and also to make it repeatable. So, so what I, what we've done with the remote labs is to try to make it to where, okay, here's a reference design from a, from a company and it's open source. So analog devices reference design for the Xilinx chipset. And then here's how you fit in your code. So you have a DSP idea or something that you really want to do, and we're able to, to fit it in to an existing reference design that operates the rest of the radio and the rest of the FPGA and the general purpose processor. And we're getting there. It's, uh, okay. it's really hard. This is not easy stuff at all. Uh, but enabling people to focus on what they really want to work on their particular part you know um that's the goal so that's the that's part of what we do now, now they got to be able to make them cheaper and availability as an issue availability probably will not improve in the short term uh but it'll improve one day and we'll we all need to be ready uh as far as cheaper there is at least for the Xilinx side of the house, uh, we know that there's an inexpensive part that's been introduced and announced, uh, and we're looking to make a board with that part. So Leonard DeGuez is the lead for that at ORI. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, delivery, though, like actually getting the parts, as you know, <laughs> yes. uh, this has not been real fun, but it again, you know, you just... I think we all will will just have to keep trying and be vigilant. And this is the sort of thing where eventually one day we'll start getting better and we'll get better pretty quickly. And I don't know when that will come. Um, paying attention to, to industry folks, they say that 2023 won't be real fun for us on the, you know, but we'll, we should see uh, opportunities to purchase here and there throughout 2023. Um, so. I, think, I think volume's got a lot to do with it. If yes. you want 100,000 or a million parts, it, they seem to be available. But if you want 100 of them, they're just not not to be found. Yeah. And like for, for those of us doing this sort of prototype or, or low volume work, 100 is kind of a lot. You know, that's that's our high volume in a lot of cases. And it's just not, it just does not seem to be enough where it used to be. So it will get better, but not as uh, quickly as we would like. Uh, I think we're very fortunate because we do have development stations for UltraScale Plus and for UltraScale and 7000 series. We have a Pluto. Uh, we have some other donated gear. We got an SR1 Pro. Uh, so, and we have some DVB-S2 and S2X gear. So we're lucky that we have things that people can log into, but remote operation is hard. Uh, you know, even with dedicated people supporting it, it's still much less of a sort of a nice experience. It's 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 not as good as having it on your own desk or being able to order uh, some of these development stations yourself. So we're very lucky that we have hardware that we can make progress on. Uh, but this is not the sort of 2022 or 2023 that we anticipated. I think by this time we were we were expecting to lay out one U boards for the microwave transponder. Like we were expecting to be able to, to to be in layout and to produce these, to have already gone through uh 
the process. So I think we are not on that track. We we are further ahead on some of the other aspects like the software design and HTL design that, but like only because we had the dev boards and um, good, good for us. But like uh, I talked to other uh, companies and other organizations and it's, it's no fun. So that's, that's the way it is right now. And, you know, I guess we just watch and wait and there's a lot of inelastic parts to the supply chain that <clears throat> the thing it'll work out but it's like it those inelastic parts are the bottleneck and and like you said uh if we were able to order a million parts i think we'd get what we want right. but we're not gonna be uh, we're not gonna be ordering a million parts so yeah. it's mm -hmm. volume is is the only thing that's really working right now and even in volume like even some of the big companies are very grumpy about the lack of of uh parts and you know, so you can see it top to bottom. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Now I got. Now I've been, got to sit down and figure out what you're using the FPGAs for. Well, what type of applications, or is is it just varied? It varies. It's uh, these are stations. Uh, all of the stations in remote labs are intended for open source development. Uh, primarily, you know, targeted for uh, amateur radio bands. Um, but available for any open source work in digital communications. Uh, the development boards are, are pretty big. They're the expensive ones. Um, but we do have like a basis three and a Pluto and things like that. So, and, and we've done some, some good work there. Uh, so, so pretty much it's for R and D. Uh, so if you have an idea that you, that you want to open source, then uh, we can, we can step in and, and help you. Um, okay. So you yeah. don't have any one major project in mind. You've just got a number of different projects for a number of different people then. I'd say that's generally correct. Our our main project is the phase four ground transponder for space and terrestrial. And so this is the five gigahertz up and 10 gigahertz down uh, digitally multiplexing transponder. So that's what the, most of the traffic on the FPGA channels on Slack mm -hmm. is about. Um, and that's, that's probably the the biggest consumer of the yeah. of the stations. So well, that's our now, biggest project. Yeah. Now let's get get it working so that we can enjoy it. Yeah. No. It's uh it's coming along. The uh the downlink part uh with the encoder is uh is in decent shape. Uh, the problem that we've had there is trying to feed it with data, uh, where we're getting some weird timeouts uh, from the processor side. So that's where we were at right before uh, Christmas break. And that's where so a lot of attention is being paid now. The multiplexing part is probably the part that we have not spent uh, anything other than a lot of whiteboard and uh, and simulation time on. Uh, the uplink is a, a really nice digital uh, protocol mm -hmm. called Opulent Voice, which you've probably seen. We've demonstrated that uh, as of last summer. So okay. the uplink part's working. It's a frequency division multiple access. All of this gets multiplexed in polyphase filter bank. So we got some good multi-rate processing code from Theseus cores and um, and some other some other code examples and okay. support from Fred Harris. So all of that gets then uh, multiplexed into a single uh, downlink that's DBBS two X. Okay. Well, I'll just sort of kind of sit in the background and. Uh... And look, I can't uh, spend too much time today because I got a couple other things going on too. But I at least wanted to sit in and see what you guys were up to. Yeah, no, yeah. I think that's a you've got the you got the story. That's uh what we talk about, and also any other uh, way for the remote labs to to uh, serve the community and to serve open source work. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I will because uh, I know James. Uh, hello, James. James has. Uh, He's our, our lead for Remote Labs South. This is located in Arkansas. And I have uh, some some updates for you, James, the uh, the fellow that has the lab equipment stored here in California is ready to help me move it to you. So if you are ready to receive all the lab equipment to fill out Remote Labs South, then we'll start start working on that. That is fantastic to hear, Michelle. I'm, I, I'm certain we're close, but I'm going to have to go ahead and double check with Keith, who is um, 
one of the members of the board of directors who works here at Remote Lab South, and I'll be talking with him to make sure that we've got the space ready for all the equipment for when it gets sent in. We've been um, took a bit of a break during the holidays, but we've been hard at work making sure that um, all of this area is set up. We're very excited to start working on the uh, multiple dish system that we'll be using here. Uh, we've gotten a lot of repairs. We actually just got in some more. Like fairly recently, we got in some more lumber to complete some of the infrastructure repairs and to set up some of the outbuildings that we'll be having down here. We're very oh. excited for all of it. Wonderful. Yeah, I was able to attend a Deep Space Exploration Society uh, scientific meeting where they talked through their the way that they set up their interferometry uh, dish. So they're doing something very similar uh, to what we're doing. And uh, they also share the goal of like, providing citizen science uh, and amateur access to to large dishes for interferometry and lots of lots of similar echoes in the way that it is uh, organized uh, with MQTT and and um, networking. They're not going to attempt to do the same thing that we're going to do with the fiber connections between them to eliminate any any excess delay. Uh, I, I talked offline with them and they're like, well, if they can, if they can manage to get a contractor out to the middle of nowhere in Colorado, which is where their amazing facility uh, is located. So if you're not familiar with Deep Space Exploration Society, check them out online. This is a really neat project and it's been wonderful to be a, a supporter uh, for the past uh, five or six years. But the you know, it's really nice to have another group that's also attempting to to bring uh, amateur interferometry uh, to, you know, to citizen science and open source uh, because we can trade back and forth and, and just getting kind of the confirmation that the way that we want to do it is, you know, the way that they, <laughs> the way that they saw to do it, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good solid echo. Uh, so that'll be another effort to bring over those larger dishes. Um, and I've, I've started floating uh, sort of a schedule for that. Uh, it'll probably, it looks like it'll be later than the lab equipment. So uh, getting the, the remote lab uh, there uh, online will probably start happening pretty soon. And then uh, will we'll be something that'll last through the spring. And I know this is, this is about a year later than I wanted to do it, but I'm, I'm really happy that it's coming together now, and it sounds like that the physical plant is in a better place anyway. So we'll just uh, we'll just proceed from from here and get it get it up and working. I would say as a recommendation, it's time to renew those contacts with local universities. And I have a contact in the emergency communications uh, amateur uh, emergency communications. Uh, sort of segment who's extremely excited about this. So I'm going to put him in touch with you and and let you know, let you and Keith know uh, who it is. Um, and then I, I'm hoping that we can find a lot of uh, common ground to to do things like uh, public service, emergency communication support. And in, in other words, just anything that he can see uh, from the, on the amateur radio side that might want to collaborate and cooperate with Remote Lab South. So things will start happening and it'll be a lot of, you know, over the next quarter. So that's my update. Awesome. We're looking forward to all of it. Yeah. All right. Over to you, Paul, for Remote Lab West. Hello. Uh, I have absolutely nothing to report for Remote Lab West since last Good. week. <laughs> as far as I know, everything is still working. It is. Yeah. It seems to be. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a, uh, it's not bad news that there's nothing going on. Um, so the 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 one thing that has been added to Remote Lab West is that we uh, got an a year extension to our MATLAB license. So we have all of the uh, toolboxes as a startup license, uh, even though we're not technical. Well, I guess we are a startup, but we're a nonprofit research institute. We don't fit into any of the MATLAB models, but after um, talking with them uh, last year and appealing, they uh, granted us uh, an enormously generous discount uh, to to use their their MATLAB product uh, for open source work to benefit amateur radio and citizen science. And we were given an additional discount and it was renewed for another year, just a few days ago. So all of that software will be um, 
you know, maintained and it will continue to be available at Remote Lab West. So I'm working with a couple of people in the FPGA community that are active in amateur radio in order to provide additional training and workshops to kind of spread the word and to show what you can do with um, like things like HDL coder, GPU coder, and all of the, the really neat stuff available. And all of this to benefit open source amateur radio work. Um, so that's a multi-pronged effort. So we have to get the word out that we have this really amazing uh, opportunity and resource. And and yes, there is Octave, which we, we love and have used many times in the past. Um, and that, that does not prevent people from using uh, open source tools, uh, but we're just gonna forge ahead and, and use uh, MATLAB wherever we possibly can in order to, to deliver the final product, which is HDL code that's open source and human readable, which um, is gonna be a priority for us. So the neat thing about the HDL coder in MATLAB is that the code it produces is completely free. You can use it for whatever you like, and our experiences over the past year have shown that the HDL code that HDL Coder produces is very human readable and of, of good quality. You do have to put in the effort to make the input code to MATLAB kind of comply with some rubrics. It's pretty simple. It's a little short paragraph of make sure you do it this way or that way. And then the code that it produces is excellent. And the comments that you put into the MATLAB code end up in as comments in the HDL. So we're hoping to really kind of make some steps forward for advanced digital uh, communications um, for, you know, usable for amateur radio service and amateur satellite service over the next year. So that's some good news for Remote Lab West. Um, and then in terms of our, the designs, we've gotten a tremendous amount of interest from someone who wants to port the downlink um, FPGA encoder for DBBS2 uh, over to the ZC, I think it's a ZC711, um, but I'll have to go back and look. So we do have a customer who is uh, who needs some support for building it and porting it over to a slightly different dev board. And their application sounds sounds really neat. Uh, so that's that's moving forward. Uh, other FPGA uses are for the receive side, so the uplink side. Uh, we're we're making a lot of study into uh, polyphase filter banks in order to use multi-rate processing for for the receiver. This is going to be the most efficient way and really matches up really well with the FPGA architecture. Uh, this is a, a lot of slog through some some fairly difficult math, but um, we're making progress, and we have a, a good reference design from Theseus Cores, the team that did this for the uh, for the F for the Xilinx FPGA that's in the USRP X310, and they're super friendly. They don't have a lot of time to help us with this, but they're able to answer questions. There is a bug that's they called it a bug. Uh, their limit is eight channels, so for some reason the the filter bank or the channelizer was limited to, to eight channels. And we did see this when we demonstrated this in 2018 at uh, DEF CON. So that particular implementation, if we take that and figure out how to extend it up to like, oh, 96 channels or so, uh, then we'll be, we'll be in very good shape. Uh, but right now there was some sort of a uh, weird limit with that particular code. And it's the last time that that I that I checked in about it. So if if uh, if you're listening to this and and you go, oh, that's stale information, then please accept my apologies. And I, I over the next week I will get completely educated about it. And uh, next week I'll have a, a, a updated report. So we're we're looking to leverage their open source code base in order to provide a good receiver for us uh, for the spacecraft or ground sat uh, terrestrial node. Uh, for any of these implementations. So that's what's going on. All right, any last questions or comments? Or anybody need anything? Does anybody need any resources or have any roadblocks that they're facing? I know we always are limited by time. Awesome. Okay. Well, we're also going to meet in uh, four hours uh, at 1400 uh, Pacific to catch uh, some some other folks that are 
that are at that time slot. So, um, so we'll we'll meet again then, and then we'll we'll meet again uh, a week from today, and it'll uh, go on pretty well. So we're mm-hmm. we're starting off uh, 2023 in in really good shape. Um, one of the things that that we're we're doing over the next quarter is looking for uh, for partners for integrating the spacecraft uh, and advice there. Uh, so that's uh, that's something that we'll start talking a lot more about in um, in these meetings and also on Slack. All right, everybody, thanks so much. Any last questions before we close? All right, see you soon. Good day. Thanks, Michelle.